Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Will Trace, Lockheed Martin Fellow Emeritus, former chair of ACM SIGSOF, and member of the ACM Professional Development Committee. For more on my background, you can see the bio widget on your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here's some more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in a constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in the global environment. ACM provides access to a digital library, the most comprehensive database in computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education, research, including curriculum development and teacher training, and awards the Turing and ACM Prize for Computing. The ACM Code of Ethics, which I find very relevant in these days, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals to make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. ACM enables the members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in a digital age. We're never too old to learn. ACM producer uh, next, before we get started, for the newcomers, especially the newcomers to this particular platform, I'd like to quickly mention some housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. If you have questions at any time, please type them in the Zoom Q&A feature. I'll organize the questions and as Chester speaks, we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the, uh, his presentation. So uh, with that, it's time for me to introduce the speaker, but rather than doing that myself, I'm going to let uh, Chester do it. That works. We just did some mental athletic training with Chester Santos, so has the best memory in the United States. With ease. Joining us right now is memory expert and winner of the 2008 USA National Memory Championship, Chester Santos. Chester, Chester. trouble remembering names, faces, where you maybe put the coffee cup, or if you do Chester Santos, he can help. He's a 2008 National Memory Champion. He's here to help us. Certainly knows he does. Chester Santos is the United States Memory Champion. He captured the title this past weekend in New York City. There he is accepting the prize. Who's the 12th district New Jersey congressman? Rush Holt. Okay. Rush Holt. Send the game to play. He's got the corner wrapped up. Then he's still trapped. Ten of hearts. Three to, three to go. Two of clubs. Yes. Uh, Jack of diamonds. You got it. And three of diamonds. Unbelievable. That's incredible. First of all, get enough of this Carol, Rick, Pedro, Jack, Andy. From Belinda to Bayern, with dizzying ass every single time. He's got the power to educate, the power to thrill and memorize. No wrapped up in his insatiable mind. Techniques stretch all the way back to the ancient Greeks. But what's amazing is that standing in front of you as a modern human being, I can still feel those techniques reprogramming my brain to remember things better. LinkedIn is awesome. Okay, without further ado, Chester, take it away. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction, Will. Thank you so much, everybody, for having me here today. My name is Chester Santos, also known as the International Man of Memory. I won the United States National Memory Championship. And after that, I've gone on to give presentations in more than 30 countries over the past 14 years, 
presentations on memory skills. I'm very confident that everyone out there, no matter what your professional, personal background might be, you have the ability to develop a powerful memory and leverage those memory skills for more success in your career, personal life. If you happen to have any kids or grandkids that are in school, what we talk about today, if you share it with them, it's going to be very useful uh, there as well. I uh, actually, believe it or not, uh, have a undergrad degree in psychology, but a master's degree in software engineering. I used to work as a software engineer in the Silicon Valley area, but then I won the United States Memory Championship and switched to training people around the world to develop powerful memory skills. My presentation is going to be very interactive today and really have a positive impact on your professional and personal development. I want to point out that over the next about, we have about an hour total, including the Q&A, some of what I ask you to do at certain points today is going to seem a bit silly or unusual, all right? But please bear with me because I promise you that these strange things that I ask you to do via these interactive exercises, they're really going to improve your ability to remember really just about anything at all. And memory is fundamental to learning. When you improve your memory, you're just gonna see so many benefits in, in multiple areas. So let's get started. I'd like everybody to close your eyes. Just listen to my voice. Uh, no need to look at the Zoom screen for the next couple of minutes. Just close your eyes. Visualize what I described to you, all right? I want for you to just picture yourself in your current residence, all right? In the living room, area of your residence. Picture yourself there and you see standing behind podiums looking as if they're about to engage in a debate. You see Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You thought those debates were long over with, but another one is about to happen in the middle of your living room. And although this strikes you as very unusual, rather than ask any questions, you decide to just hang back and observe what's going on. So they begin to debate, see this happening in your mind, Biden and Trump are debating in the middle of your living room. See that as clearly as you can. You just watch this unfold and it's becoming heated. You see Biden become upset at something that Trump says. So he reaches behind his podium to pull out a pie. He takes it, he throws it at Trump, it hits him square in the face. You can see pie dripping off of Trump's face, okay? Trump is not happy about this at all. So he now reaches behind his podium to also pull out a pie, throws it at Biden, splat, it hits him in the face, all right? You can see the pie dripping off Biden now as well. What started off as a debate has now turned into a full-blown pie fight. And these politicians are just continuously throwing pies at each other. Pie is flying all over the place. It's splattering all over. You can, again, worry, worry about who's going to clean up this mess later, but just try to close your eyes and visualize this pie fight happening between Biden and Trump. You are primarily experiencing, at this point, images, right? You have imagery running through your mind. What I'd like you to do now is attempt to involve even more senses as you experience this scenario happening. Imagine that in addition to seeing it, imagine that you can hear it. Imagine that you can actually hear that pie as it splatters on the politicians. I know this is a bit of a weird exercise, but again, just bear with me. This will yield many benefits in the end. So you can see the pie fight, hear it. Imagine now that you can also smell the pie. Stretch your imagination a bit. Imagine what that pie might smell like. Take it a step further. Imagine that you walk up to one of those politicians. You take some of the pie off of their, their face. You take it off of their face, feel it in your hands. Maybe it feels sort of sticky. Imagine what it feels like. Go ahead now, put some of that pie in your mouth. And I want you to do your best to taste that pie. Hopefully it tastes pretty good to you. Although a lot of people tell me that it tastes like politicians. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, if you did have your eyes closed, go ahead and open them at this point. That's the end of this warm up visualization exercise. A lot of people find that to be a fun exercise to go through. Everyone finds it to be pretty easy to complete, but what in the world, what does that have to do with improving your ability to remember things? Things like names, presentations, facts, figures, and so on. In fact, it has a lot to do with it, all right? If you were able to complete that exercise, you have the ability to remember anything at all quickly, easily, and with tremendous accuracy. Here are some reasons why. Reason number one, I had you there exercise your visualization ability. Your visual memory is very powerful. An example that I like to give in my presentations around the world is a situation that we've all experienced at some point where we will run into someone. We could have met that person years ago, years in the past. Oftentimes, as soon as we see their face, right away, we remember their face. We know that we've met them somewhere before, but we can't seem to remember their name, right? That's a pretty common experience. Something else that I think we can relate to, let's say you go to a party, all right? You're meeting a lot of new people. Two weeks after the party is over, you're talking with one of your friends that was there with you, and your friend describes to you someone from the party. Your friend says, hey, you remember that attorney that we met at the party a couple weeks ago? He's also a member of the golf club. As your friend is going through that description, you can a lot of times picture in your mind exactly who they're describing to you. Your friend can obviously picture who they're describing to you, but a lot of times neither one of you can manage to remember what that person's name was, all right? A final, third and final example related to this, how many times have you been describing to a friend or family member an actor from a TV show or movie? As you're going through that description, crystal clear in your mind. You can picture the actor. Your friend or family member can also picture who you're describing, but neither one of you can come up with the name at that moment, and it's a very uh, frustrating situation, right? Those three examples that I just went over, I think illustrate pretty well that when it comes to dealing with people, we tend to be pretty good at remembering faces. We can recall, pull up in our minds, what people look like, but we're not nearly as good at remembering people's names. This makes sense when you think about it, because when you interact with people in various ways, you see their face. Their face is actually recorded into your visual memory, but the name is something much more abstract to your brain. So one way that you can get better at remembering names, I'll get into names in more detail toward the end if I don't run out of time today, but one way to get better at names is to turn them into powerful visuals. So if I meet someone named Mike, I might picture a microphone. If I meet someone named Alice, sometimes I picture a white rabbit because that reminds me of Alice in Wonderland, right? Um, it sounds maybe a bit silly, but it's very powerful and effective. That's how at conferences around the world, believe it or not, I will open my presentations with naming hundreds of people in the audience after hearing each name only one time. It's by turning those names into powerful visuals. Uh, again, we'll get into it more later, but for now, what I really want for you to know is the power of your visual memory. If you can turn information that you need to remember later into something you can picture in your mind, it really helps you to be able to recall it when you need it later on. Second principle that I'd like you to take from that opening exercise with Biden and Trump is after I had you visualize, I then had you start to get more and more senses involved. As you do that, you are activating more and more areas of your brain and you're building more and more connections in your mind to the information, making it easier to retrieve it later. So I starred in an episode of PBS's Nova Science. The episode that I starred in was titled how smart can we get? If you'd like to Google that later on, maybe just look up my name, Chester Santos and PBS. You can still watch the episode, I think, for free on the PBS website. If you do check it out, you're going to see me on the show performing some crazy memory feats. Then they had me train David Pogue. You all might know David Pogue uh, from the New York Times and CBS News. He's been a correspondent for the technology industry, actually. I trained him on the show, and then he was able to perform some pretty cool memory feats after just a little training. They next had some brain scientists, neuroscientists come on the show and explain for people watching at home on TV, all right, how did Chester do that? 
how was David Pogue able to pull off those memory feats after just a little bit of training from Chester? And these brain scientists confirmed that it's because with the techniques that I've mastered over the years and that you're all going to learn a little bit about during the webinar today, what's happening is we're recruiting extra areas of the brain to help us. So areas of the brain that most people never involve when trying to commit things to memory. With these techniques, we recruit more of the brain to help. And part of this is learning to use more senses, all right? So to summarize that principle, it's simply the more senses you involve when trying to encode information into your memory, the more of your brain is used, the easier it becomes to recall when you need it later, all right? Third and final thing that I'd like for you to take away from that opening exercise with the politicians is that in addition to visualizing that and involving additional senses, I also made that entire scenario weird, right? Pretty strange. You would never expect to see that happening in the middle of your living room. I had you do that because I'd like for you to learn today to take advantage of the psychological aspect to human memory. And that is all of us with putting forth little to no effort, we tend to remember things that catch us by surprise that are extraordinary to us in some way. So if this were to actually happen right now at this moment, wherever whatever room you're in, if an elephant suddenly crashed into the room now and started to spray water all over you with its trunk, that actually happened right now, you would probably remember that for the rest of your life and always tell that story. Even 30 plus years from now, you'd be saying, you are never going to believe this, all right? So I was attending an ACM webinar. We had a memory uh, skills expert on and while I was on the webinar, an elephant crashed into my room and started to spray water on me. That might be stuck in your head forever without you even trying to commit it to memory. No effort on your part. To this day, scientists still don't fully understand how that works in the brain. How is it that sometimes in one instant, something will go into long-term memory, stay there forever, whereas other times we might spend weeks, months, trying to drill very important information into our memory, and it's, it's tough for us. Although it might not be fully understood, we just need to realize that there is this psychological aspect to human memory. There is this aspect to how our mind works, realizing that we can harness it, take advantage of it, and apply it to things that would be useful. Again, memory is fundamental to learning. When you improve your ability to remember things, you can get better at remembering presentations, facts, figures, training material for certification exams, or again, kids in school, foreign language vocabulary. There are so many applications. You just need to apply the three principles that we just went over. Quick review, it was simply visualization. From there, try to involve additional senses. And third, while you are seeing this stuff in your mind, make it weird, crazy in some way. When you combine those three principles, instantly you're going to be amazed at what you're able to accomplish in terms of memory skills and the acquisition of knowledge. Let's put this into practice now with an interactive exercise. I'm going to have you all commit to memory the following random list of words. It's going to be monkey, iron, rope, kite, house, paper, shoe, worm, envelope, pencil, river, rock, tree, cheese, and dollar. Now, when I have live audiences where I can see the look on people's faces, people usually look at me at this point like, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, not unless you give us a lot of time to do it. But in fact, everybody on the webinar is going to have that entire list of words committed to memory perfectly forwards and backwards in just about two to three minutes grand total without any further review after today, even two, three. I get people emailing me months later wanting to demonstrate that they can't believe that they still know all of the words. How are you going to pull this off? You'll just listen to what I described to you see and experience it happening in your mind as best you can. The whole key, relax, have fun, and, and it's going to be easy, right? So the first word I had given you was monkey. I want for you all to visualize a monkey. It is dancing around with your eyes open or closed at this point. Just try to visualize this. The monkey's dancing around making monkey noises. Boop, 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 boop. Whatever a monkey would sound like, I'm working on that monkey impression, but try to see and hear the monkey. The monkey now picks up a gigantic iron, maybe like you would iron your clothes with, all right? See that monkey dancing around with a giant iron. Picture this like a movie or a 
cartoon playing in your head as best you can. The iron starts to fall, but a rope attaches itself to the iron. Maybe even feel the rope, interact with it. Maybe it feels sort of rough. You look up the rope, you see that the other end of the rope is attached to a kite. It's flying around in the air. Maybe you even reach up and try and touch that kite. The kite now crashes into the side of a house. Really see it smash into the house. Picture that. You notice now that the house is completely covered in paper for some weird reason. It's covered in paper. That's the next word I had given you, paper. Out of nowhere, a shoe appears and it starts to walk all over that paper. Maybe it's messing up the paper as it's walking on it. Really try and visualize that shoe. The shoe smells pretty badly, so you decide to investigate and see why. You look inside of the shoe and you see a smelly worm crawling around inside of that shoe. See that smelly worm. The worm jumps out of the shoe and into an envelope. Maybe it's going to mail itself or something, I don't know. It goes into an envelope. A pencil appears out of thin air now and it starts to write all over that envelope. Really see it writing on the envelope. Maybe it's addressing it, that pencil. The pencil now jumps into a river and there's a huge splash like you would never expect to see when it hits the river. The river you notice is crashing up against the giant rock. That rock flies out of the river and it crashes into a tree. Really see that rock smashing into the tree. This tree is growing cheese. You probably haven't seen a tree like that before. This one is growing cheese. And out of the cheese shoots a dollar. I want you to see a dollar coming out of that cheese. Really see the dollar. That was the last word I had given you. Now I'm going to run through this again very quickly in about 30 seconds. And your job is to simply replay through this little story that you've created in your mind. So we start off with the monkey. The monkey was dancing around with what? See an iron there. The iron fell. What attached? A rope. Feel that rope. You look up the rope, the other end was attached to what? It was a kite, really visualize that kite. You see it crash into the house, which was covered in, it was covered in paper. Something was walking on it. What do you see there? A shoe. Something was crawling in that shoe. It was smelly. What was it? It was a worm. The worm jumped into the envelope. What wrote on the envelope? See that pencil? The pencil jumped into the river. The river was crashing into the rock. That flew into a tree, which was growing. See the cheese. And what came out? Dollar. All right. So now you should be able to uh, recall to me, you should be able actually to recite all of those words for me by simply playing through the story in your mind. Each major object that you see in the story is going to give you the next word. I'd like you to take about one minute to just recite this to yourself as best you can. I really want you to try this because my goal today is by the end of the hour, you'll feel that you've developed some new skills and I promise you I'm gonna go over practical applications on the job, how to use this in your career, personal life so that you know it won't just be random words, but for now, uh, I want for you to try to use this new approach, this technique. And in about one minute, uh, I'm going to ask Jan, please, to turn on the hand raising. And we're going to see if we can get a couple of people to appear on camera and, uh, and, and try to recite this for us under the pressure of uh, the camera being on you. All right. So let's take about a minute. Then I think we're going to take a couple of volunteers. All right, I think we have a, a volunteer highlighted here. Looks like Stan, you're highlighted. Do you want to give it a try to recall them? 
Yeah, it worked before I clicked the button. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, take your time. Monkey, iron, rope, kite, house, paper, uh, shoe, worm, envelope, pen, river, rock, tree, cheese, dollar. Great job. Awesome. Awesome. Pencil, uh, not pen, pencil, but awesome. You know, I, I would call that, you know, very close to perfect there. Under pressure, um, you know, with the, the camera on you, spotlighted, re very well done, Stan. Thank you for volunteering. I appreciate that. We're going to get another vol quick uh, volunteer highlighted. And even when you're not under the gun, as they are going through it, I want you to, you know, go through it as well and check, check their work. Uh, uh, so that you're you're going through this again yourself. Maybe we didn't get another volunteer. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, well, I don't see anyone coming on. Let's try to get just one volunteer, Jan, if we can turn on the hand raising and just get one person to do it backwards, all right? And as this person does it backwards, again, everybody follow along, see if they're getting it right, all right? One volunteer backwards, Jan will highlight you. So I see Hasna, hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Hasna, if you wanna uh, come on. Uh, Do you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can see you. Uh, what? Uh, all right. take, take your well, time backwards. <laughs> um, uh, the monkey, the iron, the, ooh. Oh, okay, forward. Rope uh -huh. and, and uh, the rope and then uh, the night the ca uh, kite. Got it. Yeah. And then um, the home, the paper. Yep. Yeah. Um, paper and then um, ah yeah the boots or uh, the boots yeah yeah and shoe form and yep. then the envelope the pencil the river. Um, well, after the river, uh, the rock, the, yeah. the tree, and after the tree, we have the cheese and, and the dollar. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Great job. Really well done there, Hasna. Thank you so much for volunteering. Uh, great work under pressure there. So let's, uh, Jan, let's go ahead and turn off the, the hand raising just for purposes of time. I have a lot more uh, material that I want to get through, but I'm sure that before the hour's up, so I'm sure that you all can do that forwards and backwards if you'll just give it a try. Now, one quick application here so that you're clear that this is not just um, for random words. Let's say you, you were giving an important presentation, all right, a presentation of some sort, and you wanted to at least minimize the amount of notes you were going to use. You could simply outline your presentation, all right, and come up with a simple image or series of images to represent the major points and subpoints and build a little story. You would be able to give almost the entire speech, if not the entire speech or presentation from memory. Definitely, you'd minimize the amount of notes. I'm going to run through an example. So let's say I was going to give a talk about healthcare in the United States, always a hot topic for discussion. I might start off my first image simply with a stethoscope that the doctor uses to check your heartbeat, right? That's just going to represent for me the broad topic is healthcare. First talking point that I might want to hit on with the audience is the high cost of healthcare in the U.S. Maybe shooting out of the stethoscope are a bunch of hundred dollar bills to remind me of that talking point. Next thing I might want to cover in my presentation is that under current healthcare programs, in order to get certain things covered, Sometimes we need to find a way to navigate through or cut through a lot of red tape. Maybe wrapping itself around the $100 bills is a bunch of 
red tape, right? So that should give you an idea of how you can at least minimize the amount of notes when giving a presentation. When you can maintain eye contact with your audience and don't pause to look through a bunch of notes, you're going to be a much more effective and persuasive speaker. So that's one application. I wanna get now briefly to some general benefits of learning these types of techniques, and then we'll get back into the specific again, all right? So general benefits, if you uh, stick to this type of training, that technique, by the way, that you called is simply called the story method, all right? It is just one of many techniques that memory champions like myself to you use to pull off what first might seem like, you know, extraordinary feats of memory. So they've had me on a lot of different TV shows over the years, Science Channel, Discovery Channel, a bunch of different news shows you guys saw. I think my latest was BBC World News uh, from that intro video. But there's nothing different at all about my brain compared to everyone else's. I really have learned these techniques that are powerful and effective. I've put in the training and the practice. Everybody on the on webinar, I hope to inspire you today with the fact that you can develop powerful skills. And I'm going to go over how they can benefit you in multiple ways in your career and personal life. So you've learned one of the techniques that I've mastered over the years, the story method. We're going to learn some more as we go on. But general benefits is that you're going to improve your memory in general, even independent of using these types of techniques. But that's only assuming that after my presentation today, you go out there and you force yourself to commit things to memory and recall them. You need to force your brain to go through that process, all right? Commit it to memory, recall it. Commit it to memory, recall it. Because your brain is very trainable. The more you force your brain to perform a particular function over and over again, the more it signals to your brain that that's something important for you to be able to do. So your brain finds a way to make itself better at doing it. All right. The opposite, however, is also true. If you never have your brain perform a particular function, if you're always writing things down, if you're always entering things into electronic devices, what you're saying to your brain is, hey, you know what? At this point in my life, it's not important for me to be able to remember things anymore. So it makes sense that you are going to start to lose that ability over time, all right? The use it or lose it principle applies to your brain in general, applies to memory. One quick example, phone numbers. We all used to be able to remember the phone numbers of so many friends and family members, right? I remember growing up, my parents would give me emergency numbers that they thought were important for me to know. We all could do that. Nowadays, you give someone even one phone number and they feel paralyzed in their ability to remember even one phone number. I think it's a good example of the use it or lose it principle. So I have been a speaker at tech conferences. I even was chosen for the, I don't know if you've heard about it. It's like the TED, uh, TED conference, but for Google, the talks at Google program. I always acknowledge when talking for tech uh, audiences, it's absolutely, and again, I used to be a software engineer. It's amazing what technology helps us to accomplish. It has made our lives better in so many different ways, but we have to remember that all of that technology came from where? It all came from the power of the human brain, right? The power of the human mind. So let's not let our mental skills be diminished with an over dependence on electronic devices, all right? Another quick example, navigation. You have nowadays people that have been driving in a city maybe even for five plus years, but if something is wrong with the network connection in that spot or something's wrong with the app, they will have to pull over, restart their phone a bunch of times until the issue resolves themselves because they might not even know major landmark, well-known landmarks in the city due to just being 100% dependent on that GPS. It's just another quick example of what happens when you completely turn off your brain and you're not working those brain muscles and using these mental skills, all right? So keep that in mind. Let's keep it to the positive aspect though. And that is again, that if you do exercise your memory, exercise your brain, you can keep it strong really now at any age. I wanna quickly address that because some people are stuck on this idea that someone older in age is going to have a memory worse than someone younger in age. And you know that's just the way things are. It is not true. And I wanna give two quick examples to kind of counteract that line of thinking. One, I represented the United States in the World Memory Championship when I won the US competition. And there was a guy there from Malaysia 
in his late 60s, so even decades older than me, he actually memorized the entire dictionary in English and Chinese. And he did a demonstration for the media and for people in the audience. They would call out any random page number, give a row column combination. Within a few seconds, he could tell you the word there and its definition. He could even do the reverse. You just called out a random word chair. He would say, ah, oh, that was on page 845, row three. He was right every single time. He's known as the walking dictionary, Dr. Yip Sui Choi from Malaysia. These are the types of guys you get over at the World Memory Championship. But it's an example. He was in his late 60s, but by training himself on a weekly basis, his memory skills became very powerful. So please be clear, no matter your age, you can develop a powerful memory. One other quick example, I had a woman in one of my workshops. Now all of my training is online. I have an online school. I'll talk about it at the very end in case anyone is interested in that. But she signed up for when I was doing in-person workshops and 85 years old, a woman 85 years old, she didn't make one mistake the entire day. Everybody was amazed with her. I'm amazed with her actually, we're Facebook friends now. And I see from her posts that she doesn't just sign up for memory workshops. She's taking all sorts of other classes or attending art functions. She's clearly made it a point to keep herself mentally stimulated. And I think that's at least part of how she's staying razor sharp even into her mid eighties. So keep that in mind, exercising your brain is gonna be able to keep your memory and brain in general strong. If you stick to this training beyond memory, you're going to improve visualization ability as well, all right? Visualization ability has been linked in many research studies to more than memory. It's actually been linked to overall intelligence. If you have the ability when faced with complex new information to break that down into a series of images that you can visualize, it's going to give you a better ability to understand that information. So visualization ability, important. You'll develop it with this type of memory training. This is also really good exercise in creativity and imagination, coming up with these creative and imaginative stories. And this is good ex brain exercise in general. Everybody's recommending that you exercise your brain in addition to your body. Now, with the current research, there is no doctor, unfortunately. There is no... Uh, scientists that can tell you, all right, just take these vitamins, just do this, and you won't get Alzheimer's or dementia. Nobody knows how to prevent it. But what they do believe is that by engaging in rigorous brain exercise, you can build up what they're calling cognitive reserve. So if you want to look that up later, cognitive reserve is the terminology used in the research. They think that you can become more resistant by exercising your brain, and it may take many more years for the disease, if you do unfortunately develop it, for it to affect your everyday core functioning. One of the best ways they say to build up this cognitive reserve is by learning foreign languages. And of course, learning foreign languages will be much easier for you when you develop your memory skills. I actually teach that in my memory school. You'll learn Korean again, and I'll get into that later, but I wanted to cover this important idea of cognitive reserve, a benefit of brain exercise, which you'll get from this type of training. Now we've gone to some general benefits. I wanna get back into specific. I wanna teach you all a concept that I refer to as building mental note cards or mental cue cards. I was actually a speaker over at Harvard University for their graduate students. I did a, first a one hour presentation and then I gave uh, one and two day seminars over at Harvard. And also for the Screen Actors Guild, I covered this as well so that actors can memorize their lines. This concept is very important. We're going to learn it with another interactive exercise. Just visualize what I described to you, see and experience it happening in your mind, all right? I want for you all to visualize with your eyes opened or closed some giant machines, all right? Giant machines with your eyes opened or closed, giant machines, see it? These giant machines are smashing up a huge pile of gold and silver. These giant machines are smashing up a huge pile of gold and silver. See that happening in your mind. Rising up out of the gold and silver, vehicles, whatever that looks like for you, vehicles. Shooting out of the windows of the vehicles, a bunch of medicine, maybe pill bottle syringes, whatever you want to visualize. Medicine is coming out of the windows and exploding out of the medicine oil, probably black petroleum oil, 
would be easiest to visualize. That was it. I'm going to run through this again. We had giant machines. Picture that. The giant machines are smashing up gold and silver, rising up. Vehicles shooting out of the windows of the vehicles. It was medicine exploding out of the medicine. Oil. All right. Try to run through that again quickly. Giant machines smashing up gold and silver. What rose up? Vehicles shot out medicine exploding out oil. I want for you to take about a minute to actually 30 seconds, I think is all you need for this one. This one's quick and easy. Run through those and then I'm gonna take one volunteer to recite those on the screen. You're committing something to memory without realizing it. I'm actually gonna add to your knowledge, pool your knowledge bank today, but I'll explain that after we get a volunteer in about 36 seconds. Uh, Jan, just go ahead and highlight somebody that raises their hand. And we already have somebody, uh, Vikas, if you could step up. Awesome. Hey, um, so um, first is um, giant machines, um, then gold and silver, um, cars, um, medicine, and um, Black Petroleum. You got it. Great job. Petroleum oil. Awesome, Vikas. Nice job under pressure there. And again, I'm sure all of you can see that imagery in your mind if you'll just replay through that little story. But now I want to explain what you've actually committed to memory so you see how the information doesn't need to perfectly match the image. So you all know now the top five exports of the UK. You all have added that to your knowledge bank, all right? If you look up the UK's top exports, you're gonna see uh, listed machinery, precious metals, vehicles, pharmaceuticals, and oil. So you see how you've built simply a mental note card of the top export, all right? This is very powerful. You know, when you are meeting with your colleagues or maybe you're, uh, needing to talk with potential clients for a company, you know, when you can demonstrate just five, 10 key things that show your knowledge, your expertise in certain areas, or maybe this is for a job interview, you've landed uh, the, an interview for your dream job. When you can do this, say, hey, in my research, I learned these five, 10 key things about the company, these five, 10 key things about the competitors. Here's how I am the perfect candidate. Really, nowadays, a little bit of memory skills development goes a long way because, again, the average professional these days, due to a little bit of over-dependence on technology, digital dependency, um, we're losing the memory skills. So a little bit of your memory skills training will go a long way, help you to be much more impressive, all right? People are going to see you as more of an expert when you've added to your knowledge bank. Also, whether or not it's truly the case is up for debate in psychological research. Some studies say there is a direct link. Some studies say maybe not. The direct link between intelligence and memory. It's not for sure, although some studies do find that there is a direct link, but it doesn't matter because what matters is the perception. When we are talking with someone that has a razor sharp memory, we perceive them to be at least somewhat intelligent and we have com more confidence in them and their abilities. If your employer sends you to a one day training and you come, come back and say, yeah, we learned about this concept and here were the five key things when doing this, Really, your boss is going to be uh, very impressed. It's, it, again, to summarize, a little bit goes a long way. Quickly, tips for names. I'm already, I've got technically two minutes left, but I'm gonna, before the Q&A, but I'm gonna go a little bit over. Four tips for names. Number one, whenever you're introduced to someone, make it a point to immediately repeat the name and shake their hand. So nice to meet you, John. That's it. Why? Because a lot of times when people are introducing themselves to us, our mind is all over the place, right? We're thinking about all sorts of other things. We don't pay attention to the name. That first step forces you to pay attention for at least one second. That's the only way you could repeat the name. So that's step one. Step two, ask them a question early on. John, how do you know Chester? Or John, how long have you been with this organization? That's it. 
that's going to, again, put more focus, prevent the name from just going in one ear and out the other ear. Step three, think of a connection between the name and anything at all that you already know. John, maybe you think of John Lennon, somebody famous, could be a character from a TV show or movie that has that name. Maybe simply you have a friend or family member that has that same name. Thinking of a connection between the name and literally anything at all that you already know is really going to help it stick in your mind. And last, try to use the name before you leave that conference, that meeting, whatever it might be. Try to use the name one last time, all right? Those four steps are going to help you. I would combine those with the visuals, the microphone for Mike, uh, the white rabbit for Alice. And I can get into it later in the Q&A if people are really interested in names. Um, quickly, I'm going to tell you right, we're about to get to the Q&A, but I'm going to quickly tell you how you can learn more if you feel inspired to really develop your memory skills uh, as a strength for you in 2022 and beyond. You can visit my online school, which is memoryschool.net. I would visualize a giant fishing net, maybe to remember that the URL is .net. So it's memoryschool.net. Some of you, you might want to go right now on your phone or laptop because I do have an opportunity available only for ACM members on this webinar and it's a little limited so you might want to check it out now you're going to learn there uh, as part of the school core training which is memory fundamentals techniques to improve your memory in general and that apply to various information types you're going to learn mem number memory any information that contains numbers passwords um, facts that contain figures Anything abstract, that's going to be covered. Names in depth. So I'll actually simulate introducing you to people with an online slideshow. You're going to see pictures. This is Jim. This is Nancy. This is Betty and so on. You're really going to develop that ability to remember names. A wide variety of techniques that I just did not have time for today. Um, you're going to cover sample presentations. You're going to learn Korean and learn how to apply the techniques to any foreign language. You're going to specifically learn exam certification course material. Again, things to help out you on the job, also your kids or grandkids in school. This is huge. It cuts study time in half and improves retention. It's a much more fun and interesting framework for learning. So for kids in school, it's, it's really huge. That's just, I don't want to spend any more time on it. That's just the core training. There's an entire advanced training course as well. And there's ongoing training uploaded every single month fun and interactive exercises. If you enjoyed this webinar today, you're going to love that memory school. So you'll see there, there's just a $200 enrollment fee because you get instant access to those courses, um, which are valued at about $1,000, the two courses. So uh, I had to charge an enrollment fee and then you just pay for your monthly access, 40 bucks, uh, very small investment, and you can stay a member as long as you'd like. Um, for ACM, I did set up code ACM. I set it valid to be uh, 100 uses. So the first 100 people to use code ACM will have the enrollment fee completely wiped out for you. You'll see the $200 on the checkout screen disappear, and you'll only have to pay $40 to get started today. Um, I do that. To, if you are interested, I just want to give you a little bit of a push uh, we all need that. I think once we do invest, we're likely to get the skills developed and it's going to benefit in so much, so many ways in our, in our career, personal life. So that's why I do that. Put a limit on it. 100. I realize we have like 900 people on the webinar, but if you're one of the first 100, you'll get that. Let's take Q&A now. But memoryschool.net, ACM, try to get, get in if you're interested. I think uh, Will will curate and then we'll have some questions and I'll address that. Anything on the memory school and anything about memory in general or other questions you might have about me, uh, I look forward to spending the next 10 or 15 minutes answering those questions for you. And I think that uh, elaborating, please, we've got plenty of time as we previously discussed. So cool. uh, I will say it has been very entertaining to read the chat uh, submissions as we're going along and uh, we have lots of good questions but the most one important one is that uh, memoryschool.net is not working and uh, I don't know why uh, but I've got numerous people uh, pointing out the fact that they're getting an error that the site is down 
So I assume HTTPS, uh, you know, backslash or memoryschool.net, memoryschool.net. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. So if you are out there and you're trying it, it just might be a temporary problem. Uh, but I'll go back up to the... Uh, uh, yeah, it seemed to come back on just now. Maybe a lot of traffic. Interesting. Okay. But so how does age impact memory exercises? You basically have answered that question that age is not a factor. It's just use it and it gets better. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So, you know, there is this people think that, you know, so there are biological changes that do take place in uh, the brain. Right. So um, certain processes will uh, you know, it will become more difficult for us um, as we age. But a large factor that people don't realize is it is that exercise, uh, you know, that training. So the brain is sort of like a muscle. And, you know, if you want to get a bigger bicep, you do a specific exercise curls, right? So if you want to uh, exercise your memory, um, it's going to be uh, memory training specifically. So you can improve your memory truly really at any age. Okay, and now we have, I will generalize the question is that how do you remember a series of dance moves or math or technical textbook material versus people's names? And we'll just stop there and then I'll go on. Yeah, so um, dance moves, you know, it's a little bit different. So I'm really, I've taken some dance classes. So I'm very good at remembering the steps, like what I'm supposed to do with the instructor said, you know, left foot forward, then right foot back. And, and, but getting my body to do it is a whole nother thing entirely. So it is, uh, that's muscle memory, all right? So that's a, a different type of, of memory there. Um, hopefully that addresses that. Okay, muscle memory, yes. How do you uh, remember verbs and adjectives? Um, so it can be the same thing imagery. Uh, let me try to think of, let me try to think of a good example here. Um, how to illustrate that. Uh, trying to think of a verb and then and then it, and, and then an, an example. I'm a little bit uh, off my game in that I'm tripping out that the memoryschool.net and actually my whole website seems to be down right now. So I'm kind of tripping that that ha uh, uh, yes. distracted. That's kind of crazy. It's weird. I wonder if it's possible that a lot of people went there <laughs> at once. I think you crashed um, it. Yes. Um, okay, let me think here of an of an example off the bat, though. Um, can you guys give me an example uh, of what you have in mind, and then I'll address it. Maybe that's better. Well, that's going to be. I'm reading the chat. The, the question actually came in the chat box. I'll go back to the Q and A, but let's move on to pi. How would you recommend? memorizing the first 300 digits of pi or a deck of cards? Yeah, so um, for a sequence of numbers like that in a deck of cards, you need to learn a system. It only takes about one hour to learn the system. Um, it allows you to take something abstract like a number sequence and turn it into a concrete image. Once you have an image for the number sequence, you can actually build a story uh, like we learned today. And there are a lot, a lot of other options um, but it's simply uh, turning that abstract information like the number sequence or playing card into an image. Um, there's one based on sounds that I teach in the memory school. Again, it only take about an hour to learn it and then you can start to apply it to memorizing decks of cards and easy, 300 digits of pi actually is really easy. We memorize in the world memory championship a thousand digit sequence in only one hour. So that is really easy if that's something that you'd like to do. It's kind of it's it's kind of cool and impressive to know that. So that's all you would learn that system. Okay. Um, the questions are it's hard to keep up with the questions here, uh, but. 
from the, the beginning, there were people who was, current, who was concerned about aphantasia, the ability of not being able to visualize. And is there, you have any comments on, obviously visualization plays a strong role in your memory techniques, but there are some people with that or short-term memory problems. Uh, how would you re respond to that question? Yeah, very good question. Excellent question. Good news for everybody. The memoryschool.net is back up on my end. So if you wanted to get in there, uh, memoryschool.net, code ACM, since it was down, I'm assuming all 100 codes are still available, or at least most of the 100 codes are still available, 100 uses. So check it out, memoryschool.net, ACM. I hope it looks to be back up on my end. Aphantasia, if you have that uh, actual disease, it's going to be very troublesome in terms definitely of applying my approach, all right? Uh, I do ask you to try and apply other senses as well, but the main thing is gonna be to come up with the visual first, then apply the other senses and um, you know the other the psychological aspect, making it crazy, unusual, extraordinary. Um, so just, it will be, with my approach, a little bit tougher. Now, if you only have it to a mild degree, so you can visualize, but you have difficulty visualizing, what I will say is that the good news is that you can build that up. You can improve that with training and practice. I actually, believe it or not, wasn't that good at visualizing to begin with. Uh, but training over the years, now I can see the imagery in my mind much more clearly and I can come up with the imagery much more quickly. So it's something that can be approved upon and improved upon. Thank you. Uh, now a bit tangent, but uh, do you miss being a software engineer? Why or why not? I loved being a software engineer, to be honest with you, um, but I also love what I'm doing now. So what I'm doing now, you know, has taken me all over the world. I've been privileged to give uh, presentations in more than 30 countries. So I've got to see cool, interesting places, meet with cool and interesting people. And I've always had that part of my personality where I actually like to perform. Um, so, you know, I love what I'm doing now. It's my number one choice. But if I, my second choice would be to go back to software engineering, because I really enjoyed the fact that it was always exercising my brain. I enjoy that brain um, exercise, that mental challenge. And I think that's why when I was a software engineer, when I saw a segment on ABC's 2020 on the United States Memory Championship, it really attracted me because I've always been into working out my brain and developing new skills. And I think that's probably common among software engineers, that enjoyment of uh, professional development, new skills. So my second choice would be to go back to being a software engineer. I did, I did uh, enjoy it quite, quite a lot. As some of us do. Now, here's a question. I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but how can we remember things that we hear only, like on a radio in real time, when things then just pass by quickly and we don't have as much time as we would like to try to remember that? Yeah, very good. Excellent. Another excellent question. We're getting some really good questions today. Quickly, I'm seeing in the comments that uh, the memory school is up and you might just need to keep trying it. I think it is maybe due to the heavy traffic from people from this webinar uh, going there all at once signing up, but just keep trying it and you'll, I'm sure you'll get in uh, before the, the hundred, well, hopefully before the hundred codes are, are, are used up if you're very interested. Listening to things, you can turn what you're hearing into an image. So that's actually what I recommend. Maybe you're attending a meeting and you'd like to remember the key points from that meeting. You can listen, pick out in your mind what's key and build a little story or an image for the main points and sub points, right? Um, you can build up your speed. So memorizing as fast as it's being spoken it's just a matter of the training and practice to build up your speed. There's an event in the United States Memory Championship, believe it or not, it, for me, it's the toughest event, where they will have seven people in a row come up on the stage and they rattle off their first name, uh, middle name and last name. Their 12 digit, it used to be 12 digit number because it was the number plus work extension uh, and the area code. Uh, three favorite hobbies, three favorite foods, all of this stuff. And they would randomly bring out someone and say, okay, what was their resident state zip code? What was their phone number with the work extension? 
really, really tough. So we had to memorize that as it was all rattled off seven people in a row, you can reach that level, but it's just, uh, it's a skill like anything else, you know, learn the right techniques first via the memory school and then practice on a weekly basis. You'll get there. Thank you. Yeah. Now, from reading the chat box, it appears a hundred people have already signed up. So, uh, Oh, the code, the code. Yeah. Code if the, if the code, um, if you are able to go to memoryschool.net and you do enter in coupon code ACM, if it says code is no longer valid, that unfortunately means that we did reach the 100. I'm sorry, when I set this up, I didn't know we were going to have like a thousand people on the webinar. Um, but I can talk with Will and Jan and see what might be possible on a future date. But I'm sorry about that if, it, if the code's not working. Obviously, your memory school is a valuable resource, proven success. But do you have any books you might recommend on memory skills? Oh, awesome. Yeah, totally. So I've actually written two books. Um, one was a bestseller in the UK, uh, in the WH Smith stores, you can find it right next to Harry Potter. And another one was released in the United States, uh, which is an, if you go to a Barnes and Noble store, and you go to the psychology section, it's usually featured right there in the psychology section. That one is um, mastering memory. So instant memory training for success or mastering memory uh, techniques to turn your brain from a sieve to a sponge. Check those out. Uh, those are going to be valuable for you as well. Of course, um, the benefit of the school over the book would be the interactive, the fun interactive training uh, via video tutorials, kind of like we did on the webinar today. Uh, other questions? Well, actually, we have lots of questions, but we are running out of time. So I'm afraid I'm going to thank you and turn things over to uh, Jan to bring up the final screen. So, as I said, I'm afraid we've ran out of time and it's thank Chester for his very informative and entertaining uh, webinar today. And a special thanks for all of you submitting questions as well as putting so much, sharing so much information in the chat session. Uh, this talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You will find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at the Learning uh, the website. And finally, we would appreciate you filling out a quick survey and you su could suggest for future topics and speakers uh, that should be coming up on your screen in a minute. On behalf of ACM, Jester Santos and myself, Will Trace, Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes our talk today. Thank you all again for attending. I really appreciate you all having me.